together. He was in Shanti Niketan learning the sitar. And at the moment, he's also very, very much engaged with the musical instruments, a project which he's doing. So I look forward to your talk. Welcome here, Dr. Park, and we look forward to your presentation. First, I have to put the microphone a little bit up. So first of all, thanks for the invitation, and thanks for this really very exciting symposium. But I must also say thanks for, the, thanks for the really exciting museum here. I think this uh, should be mentioned that the museum structures worldwide are just getting interconnected much more nowadays, and this is something I really appreciate, and this is why I'm so happy to be here. So thanks again for the invitation. I will just go through very quickly and very briefly what we are doing at the Humboldt Forum in the sense of intangible heritage. And I will just explain also what intangible heritage means for us. And I will stress, and I think this is the important point here, the museum as a research unit. We're just talking so much about exhibitions, we didn't talk so much about research. And especially the research part, I think, is something which is really one of the basic basics of the work we have in museums. So a short introduction to the Humboldt Forum. If you are in Berlin, you will see the museum island. Sorry. We see the uh, museum island. And this is an old structure. These are the early museums from the late 19th, early 20th century. And the Humboldt Forum, you see on your left or your right side, is a building which is a reconstruction of the Emperor's Palace from the 19th century. This was destroyed during the Second World War, then the GDR government had its own palace on, and then the reconstruction was going on. So it's not a modern building in the sense of modern architecture. It's an outside reconstruction. The facade is a reconstruction inside its modern architecture. You can see it here. This is the, the basic structure. So you have exhibition spaces around the building in three different, um, different levels, I would say. And what's so important about these levels, we didn't have the chance to get, um, um, I would say, a modern layout of a museum. We had to stick to this old structure. So this means we have kind of ground way. And we have in the middle part um, all our research units and offices. Just to see the entrance hall here, you see the mixture between modern and historical reconstruction. This is something we find everywhere in the Humboldt Forum, and this is also a challenge, and I'm just mentioning this in the sense of colonialism, because this building was already existing during colonial period. So it's definitely a time for militarism, for oppression, and for colonialism, but it's also a place for democracy. So the first democracy events were just happening on this place, the announcement of the German Republic. So just getting a brief overlay, what we have here at the Humboldt Forum's um, exhibition area, what you see here is in the up this round part, this is the music department. We have a special area for music exhibitions. And I don't go so much into detail about the other exhibitions, but just so far, we have a space of 17,000 square meters of exhibition area. One third of this exhibition area is a so-called temporary exhibition space. And this means we are changing it every year. And these spaces are made for the engagement of communities, our partners worldwide. We have exhibitions with the Naga community, with the Omaha from Nebraska, with the Haida Cry from Canada, um, with Tanzania, and so on the Nama Terero from, from um, Namibia. So this is something we are definitely doing constantly. You might, you might ask why it's not the full, um, the full space temporary. This is just getting too expensive, and we have interventions in our so-called permanent exhibitions. Just one picture for the exhibition space. This is from Oceania. So we have uh, also a lot of partners from Oceania. They made these boats for us for the museum, this is a collaborative work. And there are much more examples on collaborations. I will come now very straight forward and very quick to the topic of music. 
Music plays an important role in the Humboldt Forum because of the research situation we had. Um, what we do in music, you can see here that the exhibition will introduce the audience to the sonic materials of different cultures worldwide. The basic of the music exhibition is the so-called Humboldt uh, Phonogram Archive in the Humboldt Forum. This archive was established exactly in 1900, so it's 123 years old. We had early recordings from this area on back cylinders. I will just give you a short insight into that. And the Berlin Phonogram Archive was actually founded to research the big question, are we all listening in the same way? Are all human beings listening in the same way? Are we perceiving sound in the same way? These were just done in the sense of psychologists, like Karl Stumpf, who was a very important psychologist during his own time. And he made recordings on wax cylinders just to give you a very short example of the first recording, September 1900. This is from the Nordic Thailand. I'll stop here. The second man is Erich Moritz von Hornbostel. Also, he researched on music and he was keen on getting as big a collection as possible to compare sounds worldwide. Global sound comparison was absolutely important for them. So that means we have 351 sound collections of wax cylinders. So that means 16,700 wax cylinder original. In total, we have a little bit more than 30,000. That means copies from other areas. And it's interesting to see how these were, were divided. 30% from Africa, the Americas 20%, Asia also 20%. And then Australia, Oceania, 12%, and Europe, 10%. So they try to cover worldwide to get to this question, are we all listening in the same way? And what are sound systems, what are tuning systems mean to us? Just to understand what the cylinder means, I'll just give you a very short video. Right? Very simple machine, mechanical machine. Okay, we have a lot of these uh, recordings, as I already mentioned. Um, from the 16,000, already 12,000 are digitized, approximately. So it's all accessible, and we can share it. So, furthermore, we have collections of audio tapes, digital ones, so that goes up then to more than 10,000 hours of sound recordings worldwide. And this is definitely a point on talking about intangible heritage. And then this special concept comes into our focus, cultural memory. Cultural memory is a term established by Jan Asman in Germany. And you can read what he says about it, and I think this is something we always have to stick to if we are talking about intangible. The intangible, it's definitely a question of cultural memory of a certain society. And it doesn't matter how big the society is, it can be a nation, it can be a smaller society. But this defines the identity of a set of unit of human beings. So this is important to understand that all the material we are dealing with are connected to cultural memory. The first example I will give you is on the prison of war camp recordings during the First World War. I'm speeding up a little bit, but we, I think we have a lot to discuss later on. The so-called Phonographic Commission was established during the First World War when inside Germany all these prison of war camps were existing. So the scientists were traveling around, taking auditions, asking people in the camp if they would like to be recorded and just being researched on. A lot of them agreed, and I will give you one example of a camp from Bünsdorf. This is a place close to Berlin. That's the first mosque on German ground. They built, it was an existing mosque. This was a so-called half-moon camp. Interesting that also every, every other communities from Asia were in this camp. This is what you can see here. 
You have a Sikh community, of course. You have uh, Gurkha communities over there in this camp. And you see the commission working. Everybody was sitting on a table, getting interviews and doing recordings. And what this commission did, they had in a proper way documented. We were just discussing yesterday about documentation in the early 20th century, which was really precise, what you can see here. I don't go so much into detail about all the different things. It's just about where the people, where they are coming from, where they are born, the age, if they are family, and so on. Everything is on this one page. And I think I should play one shot. somebody could make out what it is, if you could read at least a little bit. Here's a list of all the recordings of the prisoner of war camp recordings from Indian origin. This is actually quite a lot, and these are only the sound and music recordings. We have a second commission at the same time on languages. This is with the Humboldt University. Again, the music recordings are 1,200 recordings being made for the language, 1,400 recordings worldwide. From India, it's quite a lot. It's pretty interesting, and there's a film on this, The Half Moon Files. If everybody's interested, just have a look. So what we continuously had this research going on, the second example is Arnold Barke. Everybody from, let's say, West Bengal or so on might have heard about him. He was traveling in the 1920s, 1930s, India, and he made recordings. He also made recordings in different areas, um, rural areas and so on, especially in Shantanikatan a lot. He, he made some Santali recordings. I have two examples here because um, what Hornbostel was writing there is uh, that these recordings are useless for him because they have missionary influence. So he was looking straight for the original things already at this time. It's a pretty interesting side remark. This is how they documented this, and I will just play you one short example. This recording was definitely one of the not so clear recordings. That means you have to work on these, and this is what I mean about research. You, if you just listen to this the first time, you can't make out what it is. So you just have to sit down, you have to realize if there are voice, it's a drum, any instruments, and then you clean up the recording, and you get out what you are just going to research. This is why we keep the recordings as they are, because our research perspective might change, and this means, again, the cleaning is different. So he has much more recordings like Hebrew songs from the Cochin, Jew town, Syrian Christian songs. This is all from the 1920s, 1930s. The communities are still existing, in a certain way at least. And he was very interested in Kirtan recordings. So he has a few of them. And it's a long collection and a big collection he, he had. Uh, we have more than, uh, let's say at the moment, something like four or 500 recordings from him. And there is a very interesting um, research that was going on from one of our colleagues from Kolkata, Moshe Mibomik. She was just re researching on Barke and the recordings around uh, West Bengal. She was traveling with these recordings to the communities and asking them to listen to it and to reproduce it. So you had new versions of the, of the old songs. Uh, it's a very interesting um, PhD thesis. So if you can get hold of it, just, just go there. Just read it and then understand what it means to trace repertoire back. To get knowledge about these, these recordings from approximately 100 years back now, and they are still existing in a different format. This is a research question we are just looking forward to, to understand how music and how intangible heritage is, is changing during the ages. I will come to the next research topic, and that's on instrument making. Instrument making for us means if you are collecting nowadays, I don't want to collect a single object without a context. In the case of musical instrument, it means you have to have a full documentation. 
you collect the object, and in ideal case, you also collect the process of making on a film, on a video. This is what we. So what to do with this kind of material? In this case, if you want to understand how these objects are working, first in the context, you make kind of uh, research documentation. We have several films made on the pujas, you use the conch and so on and so on. And then we had a three-dimensional CT scan, you see on this screen over here. We've done this with other instruments like the Rudra beam. I'll come to this a little bit later. This is also one of the research uh, projects over there. And taking these 3D scan, we printed the object you can see here. So we made a copy of the conch. And here you see the original and the copy. Why do we do this? First is you can use this for education purpose. You don't have to use the original. So you can hand these plastic thing over to everybody for playing. It's not a big deal, but for us, the question was much more how the sound is affected. If you have different materials, does it really make a big difference? And this is the original version with the copy. That's why it's this uh, original. Mm -hmm. was original and copy. If you analyze this, it's not a big difference. It was astonishing to us. So what came out of it, I will just cut it very short. The thing is, as soon as you ask the, the players, the musicians, they will tell you, you know, the original is much easier to play. I really had to adjust for the second one, for the copy, to get my sound out of it. This again means there is a knowledge, an intangible knowledge of the sound structure they have. And they are reproducing the sound structure. It doesn't matter what kind of objects they have. So for us, again, it's important to understand these concepts behind the material we are working with. This is why we have all this documentation on musical instruments and then taking it into education purpose and also into the exhibition later on. I'll show you what we do in the exhibition. So just very briefly on the musical instrument collection we have. Uh, in total, it's about 8,000 musical instruments in the Ethnological Museum worldwide. And I will just mention one thing because this is also connected to India. It's the so-called Hornbost Sachs classification system from 1914. And this again is based on a collection we got. I will show you this picture first. This is the, the exhibition we have done out of these. This is based on a concept from Surindo Mohan Thakur. You might have heard about him from, from Kolkata. He sent instrument collections to a lot of different museums worldwide. And he always sent packing lists. And he sent instructions on the instruments with him. And they were just classified after the Natya Shastra system. So the four blocks of different musical instruments. And Hornbost and Sachs, these two were just taking this over, this idea, this concept, and refining it, making it more detailed. So you definitely have this thing of intangible heritage used for a contemporary classification system. And this is what we show then in the exhibition over there. This is how they just subdivided it. Togo subdivided it into instruments which are played outside and inside, and they just classified it after the way how it is played. It's not any social context, it's just the material behind it. And this is how we display this. We have a classification display on Hornbos and Sachs on the Natya Shastra. That means, in this case, on Surendra Mohan Thakur. We have another one in the Janus uh, classification system from West Africa, and then one from China, which are just depending on different criteria. So you have different perspectives. This is, by the way, one basic um, 
I deal on the Humboldt Forum, it's multi-perspectivity, the different perspectives you get out of a collection. So what we do on the musical instruments collection nowadays is um, the connection to the cultural context. It's definitely the thing about the material, the construction ideas, the sound ideas. They are changing, but they are there. So we have to document them. Then, of course, the acquisition of the instruments. It should be connected to the manufacturing process. And then you have to have secure provenance. I will give you another example on sound structure. This is um, a research on the Rudra beam. This is something I've done in Kolkata with Murari uh, Adikari from Canal Island Brothers. And we were talking about one important point on the sound structure of uh, Vina and also on the sitar, the so-called Javari. Depends on how you carve the whole thing. The sound changes. And I will just give you the example of the old style of Javari. You see in the structure and the FFT analyzes a lot of overtones. Some of the overtones are louder than the basic note. This is the more modern one, it's a little bit more dull. The high overtones are gone. And this is an ebony modern one, it's very flat. But that's the interesting thing. It's not anything like the quality about the whole thing, it's about the idea behind it. As soon as you are just playing in a context of, let's say, a chord context, in a very small chamber context, this first instrument is ideal to fill up a small room. If you're sitting in front of a microphone, all the overtones are just disturbing because you don't get it in the microphone. That's why they change their making and they change their sound ideal. But if you want to play old music, you definitely have to go back to the old style of Javari in this case. Just one research, and this is something we have to get to the audience later on. I will just explain to you, this is something we also did on Balama, not only Indian ones. Again, the exhibition, we come back to the exhibition room. How do you exhibit music and sound? And here is one research. Um, I would say a kind of research unit. You can sit down, you can go through all our collections, you can listen to it, you can just get all the documentation we have. That means you can research on your own about the collection of the phonograph collection. But this is not enough. What I never liked is going to an exhibition and having your headphones on, listening to something. This is why we created a listening room. This is the architectural sign. The listening room is just there for listening to music. And we have two sound systems in. One is um, a so-called ambisonic system. The other one is a uh, Bernfeld synthesizer uh, system. In this case, you can create a three-dimensional sound room. You can sit inside a string quartet, for an example. You could sit inside an orchestra. The sound can come from everywhere. It can be everywhere in the room. And this is the experience you need if you would like to explain something like how music was just established and developed. And we invite people from all different countries, even artists, to write programs, and then we produce these programs for the listening room. The listening room looks like this. Let's give you one example. We invited our partners from Nagaland to have their own music program, which was absolutely fantastic. It was just narrating their own story, uh, up to, to rap music, to Naga heavy metal, uh, to folk songs. So it was just a fantastic mixture of different ways. And this program is 10 minutes long. And this, this room is so important for us um, that it won a few architectural prizes, one of the uh, museum rooms without an object. It's only sounding. And this is um, how I would just like to explain how we just exhibit music and sound. So if I have two, five more minutes, I will just give one more example on research. Again, making of instruments. In this case, it's not the Indian way. It's just the way how we deal with Western instruments with an Indian connection. These instruments were established in the 60s and 70s. It's an electric guitar, as you can see. They have resonating strings, and they have a sitar bridge on. This was the, the time when everybody was keen on the Indian sound. Okay. So what we did, we just invited an Indian instrument maker and an Indian sarot player, and we invited a German jazz guitarist and a German guitar maker, 
we brought these four together that everybody, these two couples, were just working on their ideal version of this guitar. Just give you a short introduction. I am Shonji Dasgupta. I live on um, playing Sarod Sushringa and um, Mohan Lina Shurabab. Also, mein Name ist Nick von Nick Page Guitars. Ich baue seit ungefähr 20 Jahren Musikinstrumente. So I will just uh, stop here. This is just an outline of the Humboldt Forum. I don't want to go too much into detail here. But the interesting thing here is what we just um, have seen. I just skipped uh, Radeshyam Sharma out um, when he was explaining what he's doing. So the idea was, well, what are the, the sound ideas for different cultures, for different musicians? And for us, it was so interesting that the German jazz guitar player, she wanted to get the Indian sound. So she was very keen on these bridge and all the overtones and so on. And then Samjit and Radeshyam have seen the guitar. The first thing what they did, they took the bridge off. So they said, it's nonsense. You know, all the fixed frets, nonsense, take it out. Make a flat uh, fretboard just to get the idea that gliding notes, this is what Indian music is used to, to have. It's not the overtones, it's just this thing how you play the music and how you glide from one note to another. For us, this was very important and very easy to get to our audience because everybody knows the electric guitar, everybody knows how it's functioning, but they didn't know how the different sound structures are. And this is what we had on display. You've seen one of the first uh, pictures over there. And for us, it was uh, a lot of material out of this. We will definitely have a second production in this case. And we are continuing this, this work. I will just stop here, just half an hour. And I hope it was not too fast. And it's just a brief insight of what we are doing. I would like, like to stress that museums are definitely research institutions. And what you have to do to get the results of your research to your audience. This is what we're here for. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koch. That was absolutely riveting. And to say the Germanic precision of the recordings that you had, which reminds me, you know, I mean, I was in Berlin just about a couple of months ago and the way they had recreated the Berlin Wall with the documentation. What you brought to us was something, you know, you took us back to the uh, Natya Shastra, to the Nad Brahma, to the original sound, and how sound plays such an important role in our lives. So, you know, this is what the whole dialogue of interrogating museums is all about. It's not just about static objects. It's not just about uh, antiquities. It's about memory. It's about music. It's about sound. And it's all about all the arts which make up our cultural consciousness. And that is why the intangibles for me are so, so important because they take us back into moment in time and remind us where we come from. Today we have yet another heavyweight with us, 
and I don't mean it in physical terms, <laughs> I want to make that clear, but even just to read his introduction is really long. But I'll just introduce Amareshwar Gala, who's here, a professor and the director of ICCL. He can correct me as I go along. He started the whole concept of mu inclusive museums. He's right now teaching in Anant University, not teaching, but he's doing a project and leading a lot of projects at Anant University, and was the chief curator for the Amravati uh, Museum there. Uh, he wears a lot of hats. I have his bio data, which goes into two pages, but it will eat into our time, and we want to have time for discussions. So I will just invite Professor Gala, and he, his work in itself will unfold and tell you. Technical person is right here. And there's a, and there's a, can I speak? And there's a working group that was established, UN Permanent Forum, and they declared 9th of August as the World Indigenous Peoples Day. And I'm supposed to be giving right now a keynote speech in Bhuvaneshwar at the World Anthropology Congress, but when I talked to Anjani Ji from Australia, I said, no, no, I'm okay, because you know, I had to renegotiate with the, world the president of the World Anthropology for Congress. And I was happy to do it. Why I did that is, I love this museum. I love its leadership. I love Anjani Ji, Alka Ji, Batu. And because coming back to India after 43 years, it was a huge challenge to look at museums in India. And this gave me not only hope, but all things possible not only in India, but in the world, because it's an international standard museum. I would like to congratulate you and thank you for your leadership. And uh, what I'm going to do is make, sorry, I'm a little bit wobbly. And uh, um, I'm going to quickly go through some slides to show you a little trajectory as to how I got involved with uh, in indigenous people. And I want you to look at this very carefully. There's a pointer somewhere, right? Do you have the pointer? So I want you to look at it from, from the bottom. And uh, in Australia, we were having high rates of death of Aboriginal people in custody, very high. I mean, so much so it's 300, when this diagram was done, 339% more than non-Aboriginal people dying in custody. So I was asked to set up a national affirmative action program for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders, museums, galleries, libraries, archives, national parks, and world heritage sites, because there were none, no, no participation at all. And my main guides were <coughs> Professor Muni, late Professor Muni Sraza from JNU, Romila Thapa, and uh, so it was, my inspiration came, came from these two people. So what we did was we sat down near Bukhana Aboriginal yeah. community in Turkey, near Turkey Creek, on the Crocodile Hill, yeah. where there were real crocodiles, Johnstons, and the old people actually drew in sand why young people are killing themselves in custody. And, and what you find is, I mean, if you, okay, but colonization displays an exposition. I mean, it's told in body language, translated. It was drawn in sand with a body language recorded and subsequently translated. And so much is lost in translation when you read these things. Loss of economic and substance, there is access to land, loss of 
So if you go around the vicious circle to deaths in custody, I mean, this would equally apply, as Stephen would agree, in Canada too, what, what was happening. And uh, now I want to ask you a question. Which box would you say is important for museums? Or what Aboriginal people said was important for museums, the role of museums? Anybody? Sorry? Actually, those of you who listened to Ms. Ranjane Kumar on the opening day, he actually used an expression which inspired me to put this slide in. Self-esteem. Erosion of self-esteem. So the old man, Johnny Watson, he said, you don't feel good in here. Can museums do something, anything about it? In body language, which I understand a little bit. So this is how I started. I set up the National Affirmative Action Program and uh, to deal with deaths in custody. And that's how the entree was for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders into museums and galleries and the cultural world. This is in the 1980s. And, uh, and then more recently, with my journey, because the same journey took me to many countries dealing with indigenous affirmative action, including the Smithsonian. UNESCO asked me to pull together case studies of dealing with culture and sustainable development. So I've, I've produced this and also UN uh, Urban Forum. And then from there last year, I facilitated the round table with all the people dealing with the National Tribal Freedom Fighters Museums in India, which is the main project of the PMO. What I found is that a lot of them were building containers before the content. That was a huge challenge. But from that, one word comes up, and that is integrity. Now, I hope this works. So, oh dear, what happened? OK, I'm just going to go through it. What I did was I looked at a diagram that was done from an analysis and research in Victoria, British Columbia during Commonwealth Games, where the opening closing ceremonies by, were by indigenous people from 50 to three Commonwealth countries. And I was on the committee, so I, I'm talking firsthand. So did an analysis with all the, it's published in a book by Canadian Museum of Civilization called Curatorship on Indigenous People. Who initiates the project? You know, you know, usually the researcher, consultant, that's the, you know. Um, sorry, I don't know why I'm so wobbly. You want to chair to sit down? No, I, it's, it's OK, I'll hang on. But just bear with me. You know, I'm nearly, nearly 70 years old. And uh, um, so the whole projects that, are, that were being done, the outsider comes, collects information. It's a one-way traffic of knowledge sharing, and, uh, and the expertise resides and copyrighted by outside people. It's a, it's a kind of model you know, that we're quite familiar with uh, outside, uh, across the world. The one that we were, I think I'm going to skip this. So when I, I'm skipping that chart because it's not projecting really well. So when I came back, to, when I turned 60, I decided to go to Afghanistan first to work on the National Museum and then in Bamiyan Valley, and then come back to India. Sorry. Drink some water. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, it's, it's, it's okay. Thank you. I'm okay. No, no, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm hanging on this. So I was asked to advise as an international curator with the Don Bosco Museum in Shillong. That was exciting because it was a six month project where 39 tribal cultural centers and museums across the eight states of the Northeast were involved to document you know, their own perspective as indigenous people. 
And this is a charter that they agreed and it was printed, shared by Government of India. Uh, whether people actually use it from outside or not, it's another thing. It's the first time officially the word indigenous is used, not for all Indians, but indigenous with uppercase I for tribal people. Uh, indigenous people of northeastern India. Shillong chart, I would strongly recommend you can just Google it, Shillong chart will come up. There are a set of principles that, that people from all the eight states agreed upon. But what happened with that body workshop came up a whole paradigm in body language adopted by Western Australian museums, then through the NARA convention, NARA recommendation by the World Heritage Committee, and they duplicated quite a bit. How do you take, how, what does it mean when you say you're indigenous, you talk about heritage? You put people at the center. The first voice of people, the carriers and transmitters of their intangible heritage, the living cultures and traditions. But we focus on tangibles, you know, landscape sites, heritage councils, museums, objects. We disaggregate all the heritage. But very often we forget what is intangible heritage, the voices, values, traditions, languages, oral histories, folk life, creativity, adaptability, and distinctiveness. These are the intangibles we often forget. When we, we just add on, oral history is very often added on to the tangibles, but not necessarily taken as a holistic approach. But this is the indigenous paradigm. This is what we used in Australia. And, uh, and also, the 17 Pacific Island countries museums, they all train with me in the same program. This is the Chief Roy Motor domain where you see us looking at an initiation ceremony where you document, as Lars was mentioning, the music and its context, you know, the tom-toms, the whole initiation ceremony. But actually to document, but ensure the intergenerational transmission from one generation to another generation to treat it as living, dynamic, changing heritage is the biggest challenge because most traditional anthropologists freeze things in time and you can't freeze intangible heritage in time. This is sand drawing because Ni Vanuatu and Vanuatu have their own form of writing which is part of their intangible heritage. This is also you know, something we safeguarded through a process of participation through museums. These are all the directors, and in fact, if you see the second picture from the top, that is Emmanuel Kesaharu. Uh, these are all my former students who, who all became directors of national museums. Emmanuel is the first black director of a national museum in, in France, Cabron Lee. He's the, he's the current president. And uh, so what, what the point I want to get across is what I found with the National Freedom Fighters Museum's workshop is there is no systematic effort at building the capacity of indigenous people uh, to listen to their voice, to seek their guidance, to co-curate, co-create, work with them. It's still us versus them. We are doing this for you. I mean, that was the rhetoric that came throughout the workshop from everybody across India. It's not going to work. It's against all UN principles. It's against the UNESCO Charter in this area. So you have to think very hard about, you know, I'm sure this museum does a fantastic job, but this is really important. The first voice of indigenous people is very important. This is Mandela's first project, the first project that he ever funded with the Ndebele. I was in charge of the project. I was working in South Africa under his presidency. And the, and the thing is that the money was for a museum, for the Ndebele in Swain. It's called Swain Eco Museum or Swain Creator Museum. But the Ndebele king and the elders said, no, 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 before the museum, we need to initiate our young people because under the party regime, young people were not allowed to be initiated. So the first thing they do as part of their intangible heritage, part of their museum project is initiation ceremony which was documented, and through that process, they informed the museum project. This is Bamiyan Valley, where I worked for two years, where the, Buddhist, the Buddhas were blown up. But if you actually look at it, when you walk up and down the valley, there are many Sufi shrines, there are many 
living cultural elements like Bushkashi, which is the ancestor of horse polo, Atan, which is a war dance, or Pushpa, which is a bit, bit like uh, first, uh, new, first day of New Year in India where women celebrate the New Year, so Pushpa. So we revitalize these intangible heritage elements, saying that rehabilitation of the blown up Buddhas is one thing, but people are living here. You know, their signatures are writ large across the valley. So it's very much like, you know, this is Brian Durrance, who the director of the first India Festival in London. And there's a person from this room here behind the mask in a display case in Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore. People were really interested. They're real human beings in a display case. But we were trying to make a point. You're seeing the mask, but you're not seeing who's behind the mask. Remember all those things, the voices, values, traditions, and all the intangibles? And that's the way we were trying to, with the Asia Europe uh, Museums uh, Network, trying to bring tangible and intangible together. 28 students studied Maoris, studied in the same program I ran for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders. They became the, you know, the co-curators at Tape Up of the National Museum in New Zealand. It's one of the best examples of working together with mutual respect for indigenous people and Pakeha non-indigenous people. You see, it's already Stephen mentioned Douglas Cardinal's creation. This is Glaciation National Museum of American Indian, where Stephen already mentioned Gerard McMaster as the curator. And uh, for 17 years, I was the advisor to the director. And I started off before the museum started in 1989 with Alice Sodangi establishing a national tribal museum training program so that the future National Museum of the American Indian would have First Nations or Native Americans working in there. But then this museum is not just on the Smithsonian Mall. It's a network of 360 tribal museums. So a national museum should be networked. That was the approach we took. John Murray Jubal Center. Remember, I pointed out the first black director of a museum in France, Emmanuel Kesaharu. And he was the director when this was established in Numia. And here is an interesting thing the way he negotiated with the French museums. You have the tangible objects, but we have the intangible heritage. How about we work together? And then they negotiated a 25 year loan. With objects came back, well, still, the old people are still alive. Working with the old people and the intangible heritage, they created the museum as a cultural center, as uh, Ms. Ranjana Kumar wants to set up this place as a cultural center, bringing tangible and intangible together. But it's a very productive partnership between French museums and, uh, and, and this cultural center in Numia. This is the National Museum, and these are all projects that I've been involved in. I'm just sharing with you how I went about. These are Buddhist novices inside the National Museum in Phnom Penh. There was no relationship at all between Buddhism and the objects that were decontextualized during colonial times. So the workshop on the whole cultural mapping project that we did was to bring Buddhism and the National Museum's collections together, because Buddhism is a living faith in Cambodia. So it's another example how we went about it. Uh, this is to do with the living communities, the fishing communities. It's a national museum in Vietnam. Uh, working with the fishing people, I lived for two years on the sea, working with the people, training them, so they built their own floating museum, first ever in the world. So what are the key questions as we try to attempt to, to define the construct of a museum? What is the nature of textuality in different domains? We talk about tangible, intangible. You really need to interrogate, and this is where Amit Lass uh, on search is so critical. It's an open text to be read and, free, and freely interpreted and, and manipulated. When we talk about multiple interpretations, it can also be manipulated, so we've got to be careful. Are cultural rights safeguarded in the digital? It's a big question. Where are the intellectual property rights in the digital domain? I mean, there are some collections that are going online from Australia, 
which shouldn't be online because they're secret and sacred items. Non-initiated people are not supposed to see them, but they're going online, where are the ethics? How does one address integration of intangible heritage in museums beyond documentation? And, uh, and Kapila Watsain, the late Kapila Watsain, you know, said when she was in the UNESCO Executive Board while we were drafting the convention, Intangible Heritage Convention, remember that which is living and dynamic and continuing passed on, once you document, you're freezing it in time. Transliteration is freezing it in time, so you have to work out ways how you're going to count, counter this freezing in time. And who owns whose heritage? Is an age-old question. It's a question I ask everywhere in, in India, too. Who owns whose heritage? Who interprets whose heritage? Who manages whose heritage? These are key questions for a museum to become relevant and ethical. And, uh, and I want to share this with you because we, we had a future project in Denmark. And I, was, I lived for four and a half years in Denmark. And I used to run learning days. In fact, uh, um, this morning it was nice to see Mike Edson because we brought in Mike for a learning day uh, with the 32 museums that I worked with. And at the end of the project, it's a three-year project, the, the summary of the future of the museums through the 32 museums is what are the aspects? Museums and collections. What are the principles? The future. You know, the transformation is to knowledge and experience. Exclusive to inclusive. I know it's very easily used to inclusive these days, but it means in Mandela's discourse, all of us on an equal basis. From looking to participation, passive to active engagement, national, regional to beyond boundaries, um, reassure. I mean, museums tend to reassure because they're voices of authority, but they need to be provocated. From being, from reassuring to being provocative, from inward looking towards or looking outwards, from static to dynamic, multi-voiced, monologic to plurilogic or plur, you know, pluralistic, multiple voices. So th this this is what the Danish museum summed up as the future of the, ch the challenge for the future of the museums. Now I'll quickly, you know, go finish off. Yeah. Sorry, my stopwatch is it's, it's gone on, on the blink. And um, this is because when Anjani Ji and I talked about, he, this is one of the things that he asked me if I could focus on. And here I'm wearing a different hat. I'm an accredited one of the two in India. The other one is Shubha Chaudhary from the American Institute of Indian Studies, accredited mentors under the UNESCO Convention. He was. You know, the objectives are to safeguard the intangible heritage of humanity, not the word safeguard. Different from preservation, conservation, you know, safeguarding is a new discourse of how do you actually preserve that which is living without freezing it in time, as Kaplaji kept on saying. To ensure respect for it, how do you ensure respect for it? It's not just an add-on. You know, I, I still remember at times in Australia when Aboriginal people would tell their stories, people would say, oh, cock and bull stories, you know. It was no law, it was not considered intangible heritage. It's the same in India for a long time. And I know it's changing in India, it's doing these amazing, amazing things. Ensure respect for intangible heritage. To raise awareness of the importance of intangible heritage and ensure mutual appreciation thereof. It's not only raising awareness inside the museum among the workers outside are working together on an equitable basis and believe me it's not easy uh, a lot of people think let's run workshops hire consultants it doesn't work that way so this is where participatory cultural anthropology is critical uh, as a fieldwork tool intangible heritage means practices representations expressions knowledge skills as well as the instruments as you saw in Lars's presentation, uh, objects, artifacts, cultural spaces associated therewith, that communities, groups, and in some cases, individual recognize as part of their cultural heritage. It's not the museum recognizing, it's the bearers and transmitters who have to recognize. 
museum doesn't go and define what is intangible heritage for communities. They themselves have to, you know, as bearers and transmitters identify. Can you see it or some of those? Okay, there are five domains. I'm going to skip this. Uh, these are the same. Oral, oral traditions, proverbs, riddles, tales, nursery rhymes, legends, myths, epic songs, and poems, charms, prayers, charms, prayers, chants, songs, dramatic performances. They all come under oral traditions. Performing arts, vocal and instrumental music, dance, theater, pantomime, sung verse like Vedic chanting, uh, certain forms of storytelling are performing arts. Social practices, rituals, and festival events. I don't need to go through this. You all know far more than anyone else in India. And uh, knowledge about nature and the universe. You see the sand, sand writing again there from Niwanavatu. This is the most important in terms of ecological wisdom, indigenous knowledge, tra traditional healing systems, and even the climate crisis, the value and importance of indigenous knowledge systems. And traditional craftsmanship, which you, you do so well here in Bihar. But what are the key concepts of safeguarding for intangible heritage? Intergenerational transmission is important. Whatever you do in the museum, if it doesn't contribute to intergenerational transmission, you're not actually safeguarding intangible heritage. I'm not saying that it's always viable and sustainable, but where it is possible. Community participation is central to it. It's no longer an option that we, the curators, consult you. That's, that's gone. Uh, that kind of living dynamic heritage, how do you deal with that which is living a dynamic? And uh, I know Bihar has fantastic World Heritage Sites. I was involved with the Nalanda's inscription. Outstanding universal value is what World Heritage Sites deal with. In intangible heritage is a significance to the communities and, and, and the stakeholder communities and, and decided by the communities. Uh, world Heritage compares value between two different World Heritage Sites or prospective World Heritage Sites. You, intangible heritage is a unique signature of a community. You can't compare it. It's unique in terms of its value. And uh, integrity and authenticity are used in world heritage. You don't use that. How can you talk about integrity and authenticity when you're dealing with that which is living, passed on from generation to generation? It, because it's evolving. Why communities? Communities, in particular, indigenous communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals, play an important role in the production, safeguarding, maintenance, and recreation of the intangible heritage thus helping to enrich cultural diversity and human creativity. So anything to do with intangible heritage, the, from project initiation to project development, the primary role of the stakeholder communities right from the word go is critical because they are the bearers and transmitters of those living heritage values. And uh, they've for a very long time been safeguarding their own heritage, uh, which is a central tenant of the convention. and. Uh, increasingly central also in terms of not only tangible but intangible heritage. Community members are the actors. They enact intangible heritage and identify with it. And uh, it's their heritage. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you document in the museum. You don't, under World Intellectual Property Organization's you know, guidelines, you don't own it. You might document, have it in your library in the museum, but you don't own it because they own it. Safeguarding means continued practice and transmission by them, but participation and content, uh, consent are critical. And uh, so I want to, I'm finishing. These are four kids from Amaravati Heritage Town. One is indigenous, one is Chenchu, one is Dalit, but at that level in education, you can transcend all these caste and class and racial barriers. And I think education for children, and I love the Children's Museum here, the way everybody makes this without feeling self-conscious, and uh, is critical. And one competency we don't teach in our universities, in our schools, is the competency of listening. And, uh, and I think that's where Arundhati Roy is 
well, highly praised her internationally because she listens. So the competency of listening is critical if you want to work in intangible heritage, if you want to work in, with communities, it's really critical. And I want to finish there, but I just want to say that there's a lot more to her, but the most important thing is to have the humility you know, to be able to open up and say, look, I might be a professor, I might be a curator, but I need to learn about both indigenous people and safeguarding intangible heritage. And, uh, but the other thing is that at my age, you know, I'm moving slowly back to Australia. I'm really so delighted and happy to see so many young people in India doing amazing things and so many prospective projects, you know, in this country. I'm really touched by it because 43 years ago I left India because I was unemployed for one year. After doing my PhD with Professor Ail Basham and Romila Thapur and Ray Raymond Alchin, I couldn't get a job because of my social status in Andhra. The directors wouldn't even let me come into the office, I had to stand outside. That's what happens, you know, and, but I'm really proud that that I've, been, I've got where I have and I'm doing what I'm doing. If I can do it, you can all do it. And I think India is very lucky to have all the young people over here, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I apologize, it was a bit wobbly. Sorry. I think I terrorized my panelists a lot this afternoon because it was post-lunch and we wanted a discussion. So thank you so much for sti sticking to schedule. And both very intense and extremely riveting presentations. So now, any questions to, yeah. Please do identify. Sure. Uh, thanks for the lovely presentation. I'm Sneha Bhattacharya. I'm from an organization called Contact Base. And we are primarily working in safeguarding intangible cultural heritage all across India. So my, my question directly relates to Dr. Professor Cook. So uh, we have been, sir, working in the desert districts of Rajasthan in documenting traditional cultural practices, musical heritages of the districts. And we have come across folk musical communities who are genealogists, they retain their entire 14, 15 generations back in their rural traditions. And the interesting part is they have beautiful usage of folk instruments. So Sindhi Sarangi, Kamaicha. I'll particularly like to shed light upon Kamaicha. It's a four-stringed instrument which is locally made and the process of making, as you were saying, is as equal as safeguarding the instruments. It's the local masters who have the knowledge of making these instruments. But when we see how folk traditional practitioners are interacting with the market, often we see that the musicians are some due to trend, some are forced to leave their folk instruments and be align themselves with more electric counterparts in terms of instruments. And hence we see the lost tradition of these instruments. So Kamaicha, for example, very few people actually know how to make it these days. And with, we have intervened there, we have started the safeguarding process, but you know it's a long thing. So my question to you is, how can we act keeping in mind that market is an absolute unnecessary evil which all of us have to encounter, how can we retain the folk instruments amidst a market which is going towards a sanitized soundscape? Okay, I'll, just, Thank you. <clears throat> I'll just give you one, one very simple example from, from Western music. I think the first thing is uh, music is dynamic. You won't change it. So if they are just going to electric instruments, they will do so. There's no point on just sticking to what's so-called traditional. 
For us, I think it's really important to document everything so that they can revitalize it later on. And I was just saying that I would give an uh, example from Western music. We have this tradition of early music performances. This is something which evolved in the 20th century. Because till then, it was just the new thing which was happening. And then people were researching how was it sounding and how the instrument made in the 17th, 18th century. And they reconstructed the instruments. They had difficulties because there were no originals around them. So if we keep the instruments in the museum, we don't change it, we document the making, in the next two, three generations, they can use these objects to reconstruct. The sound recordings are there to reconstruct, so you can get your heritage back if you want to like to practice it. This is always a question of two lines beside. This is why museums and collections are so important. Lars, I would like to ask you a question. I'd like you to answer the question you posed at the beginning of your talk. Are we listening the same way? Do people in different cultures hear music in the same way? I will just give a very brief answer. We can listen all in the same way. We can listen. That means we can learn to listen how different cultures are listening. I had to learn to listen to Indian music. I had to learn the different ways of intonation, of sound structures. And this was possible, it took some time, but human beings are very flexible in their perception and their ability to adapt to culture. So in this way, we can all listen in the same way. We don't have to. Thank you. So both of you have given us very wonderful ideas. The question is, does everything have to be handled through museums? Let me give you an example of the Indian scene. Today, from the first record that was recorded in a 35 or 33 millimeter thing, every song that we want to listen to are available on the radio. People, as a matter of fact, are constantly asking for, you know, what are your favorite songs that you want us to sing? Now, if, if, I, if I may just finish this thing. Now, similarly, it is for videos and movies. The first movies created in India, we have got copies of them. They are held by a different organization. It is not a museum, but they are held by a different community. Let's say classical music, which is a tough thing. Classical music, every rat, everything today is on the uh, cassette. And if you want old song, old people, the very great, greatest, greatest classical players, their songs were used to be recorded by All India Radio. And they have got a huge, huge, uh, this thing of the rec records of people like Vilayat Hussain Khan or, you know, other songs. Now, why should the, a museum, what is it going to do that these people are not doing? Today, for instance, who's got more interest in preserving them? Let me tell you, Saregama Pa, which is a musical organization, has got more interest in recording it simply because they get money for every time somebody is playing it. Okay. Now, why should this action be also thrust onto the this thing of a museum? So, first thing is, I'm not talking about a museum as such. I'm talking about an archive. Museums have archives, and if you have a museum like the Humboldt Forum, you have an archive on sound, on sound, on videos, on films. And these are research units. That's what I'm going to explain. The research units we had were just to document different cultures, different music. So in the ideal phase, all these recordings we have are not commercial recordings. They don't exist anywhere else. So they are not online. The next thing is that what you said, all these different archives, radios and so on, they are not supposed to safeguard their content. You also know that Akashwani and so they destroyed old recordings. As soon as the tapes were getting old, it was just demolished. It's going on. Same happened in Germany. There is no law to safeguard these repertoire. It's just a business. And I can also tell no, you examples no. from, let's say, from Africa. There was a huge cassette culture running on. As soon as all the machines are gone, the cassettes are gone, the whole repertoire is gone because nobody took care. And what, what you have here in this case of an archive, archive of a state unit. 
for us it's a law that you have to preserve these repertoire. It's a must, you must take care of it. And I think that's a big difference. If you go to a business unit, you make money out of it. If there's no more money, there's no point in investing it. And it's getting lost. And this is really critical. The thing is, and that's really the last sentence, we have huge repertoires. The difficulty we have is to prioritize, to, to select what's really important to be safe. And that's the critical thing. If, if I may, one, one more thing. Why can't these be also included as participants in the intangible cultural heritage? Yes. They can be supported by the money, etc. But why create repeat so what, what mirrors I, in the what museums? Just, what I just showed you is UNESCO Memory of the World document. This is how it is registered. That's the important thing. And this is what we do. But if you have this from the UNESCO, we do just to think this is something you have to think. If I could also respond, uh, it's an inter important question. A lot of people ask this question. It's not the first time I've heard. I just want you to give you one example. You look at the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Smithsonian Online. You'll see why the documentation and the, you know, the experience created in that National Museum is so critical to the context of the, of the museum how you know different forms of music evolved with the African American community. The context, the total context, it's the holistic approach. That's where museums have an important role to play. And that's what I would still advocate because you go and have when I can, like you say, we can listen to any of these things online. But when you actually listen to them or learn about them in a context, historical context, you understand, you know, it's it's like you know, Buddhism took birth in northern India, but Mahayana Buddhism took birth in Amaravati. And my whole PhD was about why Amaravati, why not northern India? So the socioeconomic background to it. So the socioeconomic background to the evolution of black music in the US, the museum, you know, enables that experience brilliantly. So, but we need to keep asking the question you're asking, you know, and uh, thank you for asking you. Thank you again. Uh, these are such wonderful things to think about and so rich. So my question is to both of you, and it's a two-part question. One is, um, when you talked about musical instruments, I heard a lot of use of culture. I'm curious to understand when you are looking at uh, cultural objects from different parts of the world, do you also look at the political? Do you look at the intersectional, cultural, and political uh, frameworks where that, you know, either the piece of music or, because that's really important when you look at, uh, you know, South Asia with the histories of even from classical to semi-classical, it's laden not just with tone and texture, but it also very much talks about, uh, you know, nationalization, politics of the time. Um, and then my second question to you, which is a you know, I'm, I'm so much in admiration of what uh, your life has been and the kind of work that you've done. But I'm curious to understand how, because I'm a cultural producer and I was also a classical dancer at one point, and I struggled with, uh, you know, what do you keep of heritage that is not, uh, what do you keep of heritage that perhaps may be in oddities with, say, uh, concerns of a new generation. So for example, issues of gender and sexuality, there's a lot of intangible culture that is that is trauma-inducing or has given birth to intergenerational trauma. What do you, and yet it's part of our heritage and it's part of our culture. What do you do with that? How do you how do you you know document that and how do you so it's it's In my, in my presentation, I already just put some insights on the politics, um, say the Sita. Uh -huh. This instrument changed due to political reasons. After independence, what I showed you, the modern style just happened after independence. This means you had a court music context, and suddenly all the musicians had to play for the radio, bigger shows, uh, big venues, and just, just name it. They just had a different way of performing. Huge audiences, in this case, the instrument had to change. 
Tensor change in the rate, the needs of the performer. So it definitely shows the change in social structure or politics. The next example are instruments like one of my PhD students just writes about a certain Chinese instrument, which is made to a national icon, intentionally. So there's also a political decision in the cultural department that this instrument is just now a Chinese one. This is what we are. Again, it's, these are cultural um, decisions by nation states to get a national identity. These are all questions being involved in musical instruments. The Spanish guitar, I mean, it's, it's a Spanish guitar, but actually it's a classical guitar. You can just name and go on, but you can take an instrument for an identity purpose. Thank you for the question. Um, where do I start? I mean, there are many cultural borders, not just gender and sexuality. Race is a very important one. Because in Australia, Aboriginal women will tell you, yes, you're a sister, but you're white. To, you're not in the debates. Of course, that's why I mentioned the word so intersectionality. You know, when you're, absolutely. Yeah. That's why I want to emphasize what you said, intersectionality. I'll give you one example of what museums could do, which is what I've been doing for the four and a half years in Amaravati. When I came back from, uh, from Afghanistan to India, you know, Chandra Baba Naidgaru was the chief minister. He wanted me to as an advisor, so I went to a meeting. 19 men on the stage, 18 women, uh, sorry, 18 men, one woman. Thousands of people. This is on Telugu culture and Telugu language. And over the time limit, and the chairperson says, Excuse me, madam, we're already over the time limit, late for dinner. Whatever you want to say, can you say it in two sentences? The only woman on the stage. And she was the director of All India Radio, Vijayawada. And I introduced myself because she was leaving. And then on International Women's Day in 2016, started a project called Mavuru Ma Kodari. My village, our, our village, our daughter Simba. Why? Because when I actually did the analysis of the social map, map of the population of Amaravati, which I was developing as an eco-museum, 53% were women. Most of the women who were born in Amaravati married and left Amaravati. But the women from elsewhere who were born elsewhere were marrying and coming to Amaravati. They were setting homes, singing you know, lullabies, cooking grandma's you know, recipes, telling grandma's stories. They were making the home. They were bringing up the children. And uh, so who are the actual cultural custodians of Amaravati? And it is intangible, not frozen in time. So we formed a group, Mavuru Ma Kodoru, 96 daughters-in-law, 94-year-old is oldest, the youngest, 23. Through them, we started dealing with this. And then your thing of intersectionality came across so well. The last slide with the four children, their mothers are daughters in law. Right? I mean, Dalit, tribal, you know, one was a child of a Vaisha community, but they all sat together, they all worked together. The daughters in law dealt with banning finally child marriage, even though it's illegal, it was still going on. Widows, even though Government of India gives a pension, they don't get it because the bureaucrat takes half of it. They open banks. This is all a museum project. And the police were brought in to, in, you know, to with the Dalit girls for their rights to train them. So all these things are possible if we know how to listen, how to be able to work together. This is where, you know, Stephen and I think how many conversations we talked about applied anthropology here. Participatory cultural mapping is really important. Uh, I'm sorry to say that all the literature I read on cultural mapping in India has nothing to do with cultural mapping. It's the same old survey stuff. Cultural mapping is through participation of people, through their first voice. And, uh, but I think that intersectionality, we still got a long way to go. But everything is possible. I mean, like this museum is possible. This is for Professor Gala, essentially. So, you know, you mentioned, firstly, the presentation was absolutely brilliant and a lot, uh, we gained a lot. Uh, so you mentioned you left India 43 years ago. 
And uh, so my question is a little bit about, it's, uh, it's abstract, it's a little bit about like some crystal ball glazing, uh, gazing as to you left India 43 years ago, you've come back at different intervals and you mentioned that you're happy to see what's happening here, there are lots of exciting projects, etc. happening. Where do you see us in the next 40 years in terms of inclusivity in the main museum spaces and all across the board? Where do you see us 40 years from now? And uh, where, will there still be a gap between us and the West in terms of sensitivity to the English person? Oh, 40 years from now, you know. Let's make it 20, whatever's easier. No, 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 I think it's a very good question. Thank you for challenging me. We have a, you know, President of India who is indigenous. In, uh, in 40 years, I see a prime minister who is indigenous. You know, India is changing. India is an amazing, dynamic country. There are a lot of politics, yes, but give me a country where there are no politics. I mean, if, you, if you're frustrated with some of the things, <coughs> bureaucracy, whatever, here, come to Australia. You'll know what it is. I mean, that affirmative action program that I ran, one, two thirds, sorry, two thirds of the students in the program were brown children, brown babies. Brown babies means like Stephen said about Canada, First Nations. They were removed from their mothers, sometimes as little as three months old, to be brought up in homes to breed out Aboriginality. That was the official policy, and to bring them up as good Christians. There's a whole report called Stolen Generation of Art. And so when I was doing that, people didn't believe. They thought I was mad. In fact, there were some professors who objected, saying, oh, he's Indian, he doesn't understand Australia. But my 19-member committee was all indigenous, thank God. They, they were white, I don't know where, whether the program would have worked. But Australia changed from being an extremely, you know, white, of the white Australia policy and denying indigenous people their rights. It's changed, it's very dynamic the way things are evolving. And same in India, but India is so big. I mean, I see in some parts of the Northeast how things are evolving. I mean, they're unfortunate for the civil strife in Manipur. Uh, just before that, I ran a workshop there for 40 Nagas, Cookies, and Natives. They were building their own museum. All of them in the workshop were indigenous. Three of them were university professors. They were doing the research. They were all working together for whatever reasons, the civil strife. But when I see that, we, we don't have something like that in Australia. That kind of collaboration of indigenous people coming together in that process. Rani Gaitengu is a, and she's an Aga woman who fought the British, terrorized the British. It's a museum in her own. So I think that uh, India would be very diverse as it is, and uh, if I'm still alive, I'll come back, because I love it. I, I only see positive things because of the younger generation. When I look at all the faces here, and you know, I just think, wow, you know, how lucky for India. <coughs> so, now I'm very optimistic. Thank you. So thank you for being such a receptive, warm audience and your participation. I think both Dr. Koch and Dr. Gala have left us with a lot of thoughtful things on World Indigenous Day. It's, it's a great day. It's a great day also for us having to rethink our intangible heritage. It is a real treasure trove in India. So thank you very much. I'll now request the Director General Shri Anjini Kumar Singh to say his thank yous and tell you about further programming. I'm grateful to all of you. And it has been three wonderful days. Hectic, of course, but we thoroughly enjoyed. And the aim that we had when we started this second edition I, f I see it fulfilling and very, very satisfied. And it has been a very 
learning exercise for my team, great learning, because we got people from different backgrounds, art curators, art experts, art collectors, museum professionals, professors, experts. So all that exchanges that happen, that will develop into some partnership, friendship at least. And I got, you know, somebody saw my number of cards, he said, how could you get 60 cards? I said, I have to collect more cards because there are more people. It has been great, great experience and that has encouraged us to do it in a better way. And, and, and all your suggestions and many people have given a lot many suggestions that we plan to accommodate when we plan for the next webinar. Very nice two-day seminar and, and very diverse topics were taken and people really participated in such seminars. I don't see so many people participated, but yesterday evening, in fact, we had to put extra chairs. And then I was so happy that people from Patna are participating. So see the effect you are making to the local society. Uh, Batul has given you details of another set of symposiums that we have on 22nd and 23rd of August. I know that everybody cannot come, but my job is to request you and because you know, it's a four and a half months uh, uh, binal, so there are not many other activities which I will inform you. So there are some very nice ones and hope many of you will come to see those exhibitions or symposiums. We have uh, from September, till September same exhibitions will remain. In September two exhibitions will come. One will be from Thailand and that will be how our culture has affected Thailand and how we have got affected by Thailand. So that's, that should be a very nice exhibition. Another exhibition is a Surya Kal, how sun is worshipped in different countries. And then there will be focus on Indian way of worshipping and especially Chhat in Bihar. Because Chhat is the most important festival and one of the tangible things, you know, which we are trying and we expect support of Mr. Amreswar Gala, because he is at the right position to support us. Then we have uh, exhibition from Israel, and we are also organizing international print exchange program, in which 30, I think around 30 countries are participating. So that will be very nice, another international event that will be on print. And then we will have one very interesting uh, exhibition from Italy. Uh, the artist is Taristo. The beauty of that artist is he works always uh, with folk artists. So like he will take a canvas, he will paint half of it, and he will ask the local artist to paint the rest half. So the work that comes out, that is beautiful. That is completely different. And he has worked with uh, folk artists from different countries. So he will be having an exhibition in the month of December. Uh, 1st December to 30th December and that will be more collaborative type of collaborative type of thing. And in the last same period we will also have an uh, exhibition from Padmasri Brahmadeva Pandit and I will request Firoja Godreji, uh, I will again request at that point of time to come and inaugurate. Because he has been a terrific person and very, very, uh, and because you know whenever he comes there is a little terracotta movement in my state. So first time when I started with him, we, we had five potters. Now we have something like 20. So we want you know, some 50, 60 potters to develop in our estate. And that will be our uh, last exhibition and we'll close by 31st of December. So my request is that if you can, please come again. And uh, we will certainly be informing you because we have all your emails regarding these programs. Thanks a lot for everything and it has been a nice, great experience and Bihar Museum is, and I personally am really obliged to all of you. Thank you.